David, we think our consciousness is everything that we do, but I know when I move my arm, there are so many muscles and nerve impulses going on that I'm not conscious of at all. You've really made the point that most of what we do mentally, behaviorally, we have no idea. Let's discuss that. That's exactly right. So it turns out that the majority, the vast majority of what we think and do and believe is generated by parts of our brain that we have no acquaintance with, no access to at all. And, um, you know, when you think of an idea, when you say, oh, I just thought of something, it wasn't actually you. Your brain's been cooking that under the surface for days or weeks, and it serves it up to you, and you say, hey, I'm a genius, I just thought of something, but it wasn't actually you, because um, in this vast, you know, wet biomechanical network that's happening under there, that's where most of our life is actually happening. Um, and so there are many interesting examples that have come out about unconscious influences on people's lives. Um, just th there's a whole literature that's come up recently that's sort of funny and silly about um, if your name is Dennis or Denise, for example, you're more likely to become a dentist. <laughs> or it turns out you're statistically more likely to marry somebody else whose first name begins with the same first letter as your first name. So Joel and Jenny or Donnie yeah. and Daisy. Things like this are, are small effects, but they're statistically verifiable. And the important part is they're not part of people's conscious narrative. So, so it's even affecting behavior. Oh, not yeah. just doing things unconscious is part of what you want, but it's, it's affecting things that you decide upon that you don't know why you've done it. That's exactly right. And there's a whole category of things like this. It turns out if you're holding a warm mug of coffee, you will describe your relationship as your mother, <laughs> with your mother as being closer than if you're holding a cup of iced coffee, in which case you'll describe that relationship farther. If you're given a political opinion questionnaire and, and you happen to be standing next to a hand sanitizer, you will, your political opinions will become more conservative when you're standing next to the hand sanitizer, presumably because of a threat of outside uh, forces. <laughs> um, so there are all sorts of measurable things like this, and these are small, but they add up. And it turns out that um, you know, a, lot of, a lot of our conscious narrative about why we did the things we did in life so look, doesn't this, always map on. This is hard science. You've done this in the lab. This is not just uh, anecdotal stuff. It's statistically valid. You've done it yourself. Th these are actually my colleagues who did those studies. But yes, they did statistically rigorous stuff. Okay. Does that give any justification to all the Freudian, subconscious, psychoanalytic stuff that's largely been discredited over the years? Ah, well, that, that part has not been discredited. So, <clears throat> so Freud was the first one to really nail the idea of the unconscious. Mm -hmm. It turns out there's been a long history, since at least the 1200s, of people suspecting mm -hmm. that you wouldn't be able to explain everything about human nature just by sort of rational this and that. Um, you know, even, even Augustine realized at some point, he realized, uh, gosh, how do you explain things like a little hiccup or a sudden laugh that you weren't <laughs> expecting? That, that doesn't seem to be part of your mind as such. And so people started suspecting this, but no one really nailed it until Freud. Now, what has fallen out of favor are very, you know, particular things he said about it, but the idea that your conscious mind is just the tip of the iceberg is really correct. That part has not changed. Now, Freud lived before the blossoming of modern neuroscience, sure. so we know a lot more now and we can sort of try to dig down in there. So in, in, in going further in understanding how the brain works, uh, what, what is the role of illusions? We see optical illusions that are so powerful, you know it's an illusion, but still you see it as an illusion. Yeah. I mean, I think what, what illusions illustrate very nicely is that we take everything for granted. You open your eyes and there's the world and all its golds and blues and browns and so on. Voila, it's easy, you just open your eyes. But in fact, a third of the brain is devoted to vision. And the only reason it seems effortless is because there's so much effort behind <laughs> it, so much machinery behind it. So illusions are a good way of us teasing this apart and realizing that the only reason we see the world the way we do uh, and we believe the reality we're in is, it's like we're fish in water, trying to describe water. We've never really been outside of it, so we believe it. Illusions are essentially bubbles in the water that tell us something funny is going on. Well, I think that idea can be extrapolated into our whole cognitive life, how we think about things. We're like fish in water. We think, oh yeah, this is how ideas come to us. This is what I believe. Why do I believe this? Why do I vote this way? Well, that's just the kind of person I am. It's correct and so on. But of course, someone else, people have very different realities on the inside. And irrespective of their conscious narratives, they're really it has to do with stuff much deeper down. That they have no conscious awareness of. That's right. Usually we have no access to why we believe those things that we do. And in fact, they are a very complicated, untanglably complicated interaction of genetics and environment.
by which I mean, you know, the genes you come to the table with mixed with every experience you've ever had, including the environment in utero and your mother's <laughs> womb and the lead paint on the walls and the abuse as a child and the experiences you had and the culture you're embedded in. All of those things set brains off on different trajectories and then you feel like you're a certain type of person. Now, some people will take all that data, harden it, and say, therefore, there's a deterministic sense that what we think we are in charge of ourselves is really not the case, that most, if not all, of what we think and what we do is determined and not determined by our own free will mind, but be determined by past sequences of genetics, environment, but all expressed in, in brain tissue and brain synapses, so that what I do is just the product of the past, and we are all essentially automatons. Well, there's a set, so that might be true. Um, this issue of do we have free will or not is a contentious topic. Many neuroscientists land on the side that we probably don't have free will because everything in the brain is connected to other things in the brain. So everything's driving and being driven by other things. So it's hard to figure out how we would slip the ghost in the machine in there, the uncaused causer into that otherwise maybe deterministic system. On the other hand, it may be that we do have some sort of free will and that our science is just simply too young to understand that at the moment. What seems clear to me is that we don't have a killer experiment to distinguish those two. And if, but, but what is clear to me is if we do have any free will at all, it has very little play in the wheel. It's a bit player in the system of the brain. Well, certainly in the uh, subconscious and in the visual illusions we're talking about, you don't have free will because I, when I see a visual illusion, I try to see it another way and I can't. I mean, you can sometimes see it in two different ways. That's a different kind of illusion. That's, that's exactly right. And, and part, you know, just to take a behavioral example, part of what started making me really think, boy, you don't have that much play in the wheel with your free will is um, when you look at, for example, criminals across the spectrum, if you look at somebody like Ted Bundy, a serial murderer, you can't say, oh, well, he's just like me on the inside, but he used his free will to make bad decisions, and I get credit for using my free will to make good decisions. Your brain and his brain are so different that you can't know what it's like to, him, to be him. You can't step inside of his shoes, neurally speaking. What that means is you might be able to use your free will to change a little bit of your trajectory in life, but you can't use your free will to, to be him, and he can't use his free will to be like you. You guys are off on different brain development trajectories, and, and you, can't, you don't have very much room to change. So with all you've done in understanding all these systems that are subconscious, particularly illusions, uh, how then does it make you feel about the control that you have yourself of your own behavior. One can think about the brain as a company with a CEO atop and all the 100,000 employees underneath. Who makes the decision in a corporation? The answer is the entire corporation makes that decision. The, the CEO can't go off and do something completely wacky. He's tied into the core competencies of the company. They can't do stuff without the CEO. He can't do stuff without them. The system as a whole makes choices and decisions. It interacts with the rest of the world and it navigates itself through the world. So I, I don't feel like uh, you would look at Continental Airlines and say, well, it's just a deterministic system. I mean, you might, but it's still a company that makes choices.